What is going on, investors? Hopefully, you guys are doing well out there. That is right. It is Friday. It is time for the weekend, and it is time for the Fang Stock Recap Show, where every Friday here on the Investor Channel, we recap all the major news of the week and the technicals from all the major Fang Stocks. And boy, it was an eventful week from a technical standpoint and a news standpoint for several of these companies. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, just really quickly, I was off this week. I was on vacation, and it made me think there's other ways that I want to communicate with you guys. I just started started a newsletter on Substack. The best news is that it's 100% free like everything here on the Investor Channel. So if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, I'll put a link to that in the description below. It'll basically be kind of a recap of some, some thoughts that I might have during a week, but it also might have a trades that I've made, investments that I've made, a little bit inside look, stuff that might not make it in a video will be tuned to our newsletter. I'd appreciate it if you wanted to check that out. Moving on to Facebook, start of the week at 208, trended down to about $200 per share. We'll talk about, uh, does it look like Facebook's finally starting a bottom? I know a lot of people are wondering that since this stock has obviously uh, fallen off a cliff. Can it find some footing down here at about $200 per share? Can we buy the dip? We'll answer those questions from a technical perspective. State attorney generals are adding TikTok to a child safety probe. They have already have Facebook and Instagram in their graphs saying that these social networks uh, really are harmful to children in certain ways. And we'll see if there's any ramifications from that. And moving on to Apple, start of the week at 164, basically flat, although it was as high as about 168, trended back down to about flat on the week to about 163. Apple says April 11th, which is next month, is the return for the office date for its corporate staff. It looks like they'll start by spending about one day in the office couple weeks will go by, then they'll do two days a week, then a couple more weeks will go by, It'll then it'll be three weeks away. We've got stories out of this uh, from Google and I think Microsoft as well. This is not necessarily bullish for these companies, but if you are an investor in businesses that relate to around where these companies congregate, well, certainly some restaurants, movie theaters, all those types of things, even commercial REITs, that can be beneficial because as these consumers or these workers come back to work, they have obviously will be great consumers in the area as well. Apple cuts off their online sales and their product exports to Russia. I think we all know why. We also saw more stories of this. Looks like the world is kind of, uh, you know, alienating Russia to a certain degree. And look, who can't blame them? Moving on to Amazon, start of the week at 3054 is just slip sliding away down to about $2,900 per share. I almost jumped in today and bought some fractional shares of this in my son's account. I just didn't pull the trigger on that. We'll talk about maybe why from a technical perspective here in a moment. MGM and Amazon deal said to be sent to the FTC front office, and you knew this would, okay? It was an $8.5 billion deal that included MGM Studios, GoldenEye, James Bond, those types of films, along with a plethora of other content included in this deal. And for some reason, the Federal Trade Commission is looking looking at this with a fine tooth comb, which I don't necessarily really understand because when you look at Amazon's share of on online entertainment, streaming, all those types of things, they're, they're not even close to being in first place, but obviously these things are expected these days. Amazon is said to move to press the FTC's decision on their $8.5 billion deal. So I don't know how Amazon is able to press them on this. I'm sure they're trying to figure out a way to move this along. I think Amazon is probably sitting in the same boat that a lot of of us are understanding that this deal doesn't necessarily put Amazon in a, a like kind of a monopoly situation when it comes to content. Does it enhance it? Does it hurt maybe some competitors out there? Maybe a little bit, but this space is so wide and so broad that I don't really exactly know what the holdup is other than just typical bureaucracy here in the United States. Amazon is expected to close its bookstores and some of its other brick and mortar outlets. This does not include Whole Foods and maybe some other merchants that they thinking about opening. We talked about how they're expected to open a fashion store in greater Los Angeles, a rather large one. In fact, they also have those go stores, which are the cashier list grocery stores or kind of convenience stores. This doesn't appear to be that. It's the four star stores, which I saw one when I was on vacation and uh, some other pop-up bookstores that they have. It looks like those may be closing here in the coming weeks ahead. Teladoc Health spiked on its partnership with Amazon for its virtual care on Alexa. So they basically partnered here and it looks like Alexa will be integrated into this 
I don't exactly know why Teladoc spiked on this because I actually think deals like this are better for Amazon than the company that they're partnering with. Sure, it's nice to bolt that on, but I tell you what, Amazon's probably going to collect a plethora of data off of this and use that to their advantage when it comes to Alexa. Moving on to NVIDIA, start of the week at 238. This one just continues to trend down. We are going to get back into this stock. We'll talk about it from a technical perspective. Are we close to buying the dip on NVIDIA? End of the week, closer to about, really in the after hours, close to 227 on that one. Now, NVIDIA had a cyber attack last week. We talked about that on the video, and that leaked employee credentials and potentially proprietary information about the company and its software and its services. We'll see if this has an impact on the company in the future. My guess is that while they have proprietary information, the chip space changes so often. And look, this would have to get in the hands of an Intel or an AMD or maybe even Apple for it to really matter to NVIDIA. My guess is while it's embarrassing for NVIDIA, they'll make it through that. Moving on to Google, start of the week at $2,662 per share, ended basically flat down to about $2,634 on that one. Google is to stop selling ads in Russia amid, obviously, the conflict that's going on there, likely not necessarily tangible to any of these businesses. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting situation, and obviously, we're keeping a close eye on this. Not necessarily going to affect this sector that much, but obviously, the longer and more prolonged these things type to go, and maybe if they start spreading, certainly could be an impact on a lot of different things. Google to return its employees to the offices in early April, just like Apple. This also appears to be like Apple where they're going to do a little bit of hybrid stuff. So they realize that it's going to be tough that you sent people home for basically two years and then all of a sudden call them back to work, have them sit in traffic and have them to adjust their lives in terms of childcare and those types of things. Well, it looks like they'll do some hybrid work for about three days per week with maybe another two days of remote work. So Google mixing up just like Apple is. My guess is that's probably the future of work, at least here out in San Francisco. Moving on to Microsoft, start of the week a little bit higher, about 295, end of the week at 289. We'll talk about can that create a buying opportunity with Mike? We'll talk about with all these companies, is there a buying opportunity with Microsoft? There not happen to be a lot of news this week. Tesla, start of the week lower at 824, trended up ended up trending a little bit down this week. We had a big spike in this stock earlier in the week. Some people contribute that to Russia and the fact that maybe in terms of gas prices soaring, it certainly could help out uh, you know companies like Tesla. That's just the reason why I switched to a Tesla uh, late last year is because I saw where gas prices were going and I sure as heck didn't want to pay the $6 a gallon where it's headed out here in California. Tesla ended the week at 839. Lots of news out of Tesla this week. They won approval for their German Gigafactory. This this is obviously, we've kind of been waiting on this for several months now, or at least for a quarter or two. The Gigafactory is now, it looks like it's ready for production. There was a lot of environmental bureaucracy that they had to work through, but we've gotten through that with Tesla. And the Gigafactory is expected to do about 500,000 vehicles per year and also battery production on site as well. The sooner that Tesla can ramp this up close to this 500K, I tell you what, for a company that I think delivered a million vehicles or so last year, this would be a very significant addition to the company. Obviously, a Giga Texas as well will bolster the company's production capabilities. Panasonic to build a huge U.S. battery plant to supply Tesla. This is expected to be located between or somewhere in the Oklahoma or Kansas area to supply the Texas region, which obviously we know as well. The Gigafactory there expected to come online as well pretty soon. So Tesla really getting all its ducks in a row and in terms of the plants to make the cars, but also the batteries that need to be obviously a key fixture of the car as well. Tesla secures a lithium supply deal through Core Lithium. This is an Australian miner, and obviously this is a big part of Tesla's business. You have the actual making of the cars, you have the making of the batteries, but then obviously you have the raw materials involved all in that, and probably lithium being the probably the one that you can't replace, right? Okay, there's lots of ways to make cars. I mean, yeah. Yeah, there's steel, there's carbon fiber, those types of things. Obviously, to make a car efficiently and pop, uh, profitable has to be made of steels and plastics. Those, we've seen some supply di chain disruption on those, but for the most part, steels and plastic pretty readily available, whereas this lithium to supply these batteries, certainly a key fixture in Tesla's 
future growth plans. Elon Musk says Tesla would not, and I repeat, not stop any union vote out here in California. It could that he already has a, an idea on how the employees would vote out here. Even if Tesla employees were to go union out here in California, first of all, that process would take a little while. Also, even when you unionize as workers, it doesn't necessarily guarantee whatever wage demands or workplace environment demands that you have. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that they would be implemented right away. Also, we know that Tesla is more than likely a company that is going to go more and more into robotics. I think we assume that about Amazon as well, as they have a, a fair amount of employees, a lot of employees, and maybe the most here in the United States. Tesla, while not that many, certainly will go more and more to that robot side. So even when you get union votes, and even if this something like this were to happen, the company could obviously pivot more of its production maybe to other states and other areas, but certainly California being one of the largest markets out here in for Tesla, certainly something that could happen in the future. Moving on to the technical segment of the show, we'll kick things off with Facebook. Obviously, we have this big old drop. We, we sliced through the 240s, sliced through 220s, came and hit our heads right in that 200 range. Now, in the intermediate term, I mean, we're kind of, we made it a low down here in February. February, and we created a higher sets of lows. Now, if Facebook were to come back all the way up here to about $220 per share, it wouldn't surprise me. But what that would do was not necessarily confirm, but in the in the shorter term would confirm that this one is starting to make a little bit of a bottoming pattern. And you might say, well, I, I got to get it on this breakout and it doesn't have to get all the way up here to two. It, it really needs to break above about 213, 214, 215 on this one. You put up a green candle next week up above the previous sets of highs, which are right here in about 209, 210. You get above that and then you have a pullback in the subsequent weeks. Something like this could take a week. It could take two weeks. It could take a month. But here's the here's where I would want to buy Facebook, honestly. Okay. If you can put up a green candle above the previous highs up here at 211, you break up into the 215, 216, maybe even as high as 220 on this one. I would expect a red candle to show up over the, a couple of days or maybe a week, maybe even a month. But we pull back. And if as long as we don't go below the previous lows around 207, 205 on this one, then we're creating a bottoming formation. I think you could buy the subsequent pullback on that one. And shorter term, we would start to be in an uptrend on this one. We've got to keep in mind, though, with Facebook, they've got earnings coming up in April. At, towards the end of April, more than likely, these things can move around. But we're looking like late April, early May at the latest for earnings on Facebook. And those are going to be so closely monitored. And certainly insiders will be placing their bets on which way they think that's going to go. When you have a stock drop this much, if Facebook really has good and solid earnings and they beat on the top and bottom line and things just look to be humming, well, this is a stock that could really break through some of this resistance up here and pop all the way back up into the 230s, 240s, okay, really easily. If May or April earnings turn out to be a stinker, well, this could just be a short-term bounce and all of a sudden this stock could continue to break down. We'll see which way Facebook tends to go. Now, moving on to Apple, still looks really good, okay, from a technical perspective. And I'm talking about a longer term, a technical perspective. You could draw in a upper trend line on this one. And while it has broken through within a day or two, maybe a day or two, it's broken that trend. For the most part, this is still in an uptrend. But in the shorter term, though, with Apple, you are making lower sets of highs. So we have a group of highs here, lower set here, and a lower set, it looks like to be confirmed here. Now, if next week we are to break up above this range, get up into that 175, 176 range, that could mean that we may have, this could be the bottom down here, quite frankly, at back in February in the 150s. The opposite happens, and I think you just continue to be patient on this one. If these stocks continue to break down into next week, it likely means we have another grouping of lower highs, and that what that usually means is lower sets of 
lows are coming and that means lower prices. Next week is a critical week for these stocks from a technical perspective. We'll see which way they decide to go. Now, moving on to Amazon. We are range bound with Amazon. Bottom of the range is about 2,700. We've moved that down. It was a little higher up here, about 2,900. We've moved that down based on the most recent price action. There appears to be support for this stock down here at about $2,700 per share. In the shorter term, I mean, we're talking about just over the last couple of weeks, it is making a shorter term uptrend where it's made some lows down here and it made us higher sets of lows. Wouldn't pay much stock into that one. The resistance is up here at 3,100 until Amazon can get solidly above 3,100. And I really wouldn't get excited about this one till it got up above 3,500 on this one. Okay. We're still $600 away from that. Otherwise we assume Amazon is stuck in this range. It is not doing anything that really is surprising. If you want to accumulate shares of Amazon, you believe the future of revenue growth and profits are down the line. Well, I tell you what, accumulating shares in this sideways consolidation, no one is going to blame you because once I, I it's, I'm fairly confident Amazon's going to be able to break out as long as they continue their revenue growth and their profit. Amazon's going to break out from this range at some point. And I tell you what, once they break out from this range, this, the sky's the limit on this stock. Now there is a limit on it, but I think this one could comfortably get up to the $4,000 per share, which is over $1,000 higher than where the stock is today. Moving on to NVIDIA, man, we want to get back into this one, but we're being ultra patient. This is the other thing that is uh, what my newsletter is going to talk about. Uh, stocks that I have my eye on, stocks like NVIDIA that I was in, then I was out, and now I'm looking to get back in on this one. The reason why I haven't gotten back in on this one is because we just have not simply reversed trend on this one. This red trend line that I have right here, I'll make it even a little thicker because this is a really strong trend line. Okay. We're creating lower sets of highs all along here. There is a level of support down here at about 229, basically where the stock is. Actually, the stock is lower in the after hours. It's closer down here to about 227, but the stock is just kind of hanging out in this area. And we have to assume that this red trend line is still intact until we bust up over it. Okay. So we're going to make lower sets of highs. That means lower sets of lows. That means lower prices for Nvidia. I've got a target down here between about 120 on this one up to about 150. You could probably extend this box a little bit higher if you wanted to. You could probably come all the way up into this range, into the 180s if you want. Anywhere in here, I'd be really excited. Lower than that, down in this area, 150, 160 on this one, be very excited. Right now, that's where the trend appears to be with NVIDIA until we see a reversal. We're just going to stay on the sidelines with that one and maybe purchase it in the coming weeks ahead. Moving on to Google, looks very much, at least in the shorter term, very much like Amazon. We are range bound between about 2,500 all the way up to about 3,000. This one's been a very, very predictable trade. It's been a buy down here at 25 and you look to start selling right around 2,700 on this one. You get above 2,700 and it is absolutely a sell. You would not want to see Google break below that $2,500 range. You break below that that would be incredibly bearish. That would bring obviously much lower prices on this one, but I think you could get as low as about $2,000 on this one. Obviously on the bull case, you're looking for a break above 3,000. What would spike it up over that? Obviously we have the split upcoming with Google that could potentially monkey around with the share price, but right now the the, the split isn't really doing a lot to move this stock. A lot of macro stuff obviously in the, micro, in the markets contributing to that as well. Moving on to Microsoft, looks a lot like Nvidia, quite frankly frankly, that we are making lower sets of highs along the way. Look, we tried to bust up it through this week. We got up to about 302, but really to take out the previous sets of highs, we actually need to get much closer to about 308, maybe even as high as about 315 on this one. We didn't make it. We're still making lower sets of lows all along the way here with Microsoft. There is a clear area of support down here at 272. I can see buying the dip on this one. In fact, I think I did. I didn't get it on this green candle, like this low of this green candle, but I bought somewhere down in here with Microsoft. When I say that I buy, we, let's assume I want 10 shares of Microsoft and it's probably not that much because it's in an IRA account, but I am buying one share at a time. Okay. And I sit this is probably the number one mistake I see from newer investors. They want 20 shares of a company, 10 shares, hundred shares. Doesn't matter what it is. Buy small chunks at a time. Okay. If you want 10 shares, buy one to two shares at a 
of time and wait, especially when we are in a downtrend. When we're locked in an uptrend with a stock like we were back in June and July of last year with Microsoft and pretty much all these stocks, I can see being a little bit more aggressive buying the dip. I've gone over that enough here on the channel that when stocks are in an uptrend, confirmed locked in an uptrend, you can buy the dip. It's the opposite. When stocks are in a down channel, a down trend, you do not step in there and immediately buy the dip. If you do want to buy the dip, you buy a very, very small amount of it because it's very easy to be wrong on this one and it's very easy to get shares at a much lower price. Moving on to Tesla, this one also confirming lower sets of highs, okay? We have highs up here at 1,200, lower group here at 1,100, an even lower group here at about 9.30, and an even lower group down here at 8.30. Now, is the bottom back, we saw back on February 24th, down here at about $690 per share? That remains to be seen. I think we retest this area again with Tesla. If you don't get all the way back down below 720 and then we have a nice little bounce up above and then a bounce back down, I think you can start buying these dips. Just like we talked about with Facebook, once you start creating a shorter term uptrend with these stocks, that is when I'll step in here and buy the dip. Not necessarily doing that with Tesla or really any of these stocks, but they're starting to set up maybe a little bit that they're starting to feel like we are reaching a bottom with some of these stocks. Remember that these downtrends with these stocks tend to go a heck of a lot faster than the uptrends, okay? Uptrends tend to last a very, very long time, sometimes months, oftentimes years as well, whereas the downtrends happen over usually just a month or two, 60 to 90 days or so. So we're expecting these down legs to end at some point and we're just being patient because of exactly what I just told you. The uptrends tend to last a long time and we can accumulate these shares over a long period of time because if these stocks break out above or back to all-time highs, there's plenty of money to be made. We just don't want to be early stepping in and buying the dip. That was the Fang Stock Recap Show. Hopefully you guys have a great weekend. I'll have more videos this weekend. My apologies for the lack of videos last week. I was on vacation. As you can tell, I'm back in the office and we're ready to go. Hopefully you guys have a great weekend. Good luck with your investments.